Okay, hello again, GMAT enthusiasts. Welcome back to Grocket.com and the OGTV program. My name is Jim Jacobson. There, picture of me there. <clears throat> My voice coming into your ears in theory. And we are going through the uh, official guide to the test, the 12th edition, like it says in the lower left. Um, every single question in the book going through it, um, or every single question that has an answer anyway. Um, I guess I should check to make sure we're not actually doing, uh, whether we're doing the essays at the end. That would take a long time, and those don't actually really have an answer, but um, I'll have to see. I'll find out from the powers that be whether we're doing that. But at any rate, we, we are a ways away from that. Um, <clears throat> when we left off, we were in the critical reasoning section, and that's going to continue this time uh, for a few more times, actually. We finished up with... Um, Looks like question number 65. Number 65 was the last one that we did. So we're going to pick up with question number 66 on page 505. Um, as before, I will read the passage to you and the question stem. Uh, you do need to have a copy of the book in front of you so that you can um, follow along, read answer choices, um, reread anything that I say that you need to go back and refresh your memory. Um, and there we go. I need that to get to work. So page 505, question number 66 is where we're starting. And uh, there's no good reason to put off starting any further. So let's do that. Number 66. To protect certain fledgling industries, the government of Country Z banned imports of the types of products those industries were starting to make. As a direct result, the cost of those products to the buyers, wait, yes, as a direct result, um, the cost of those products to the buyers, several export dependent industries in Z went up, uh, sharply limiting the ability of those industries to compete effectively in their export markets. Which of the following conclusions about country Z's adversely affected export dependent industries is best supported by the passage? So this is one of the questions where additional clarifying or focusing information is given in the question itself. Here, we do need to focus in on country Z's adversely affected export-dependent industries. So we need to summarize what aspect of the argument affected them. So the export-dependent industries, their costs went up uh, because they could only, basically they could only buy uh, something that they used to supply, some, something that they used in the making of their products, they could only get domestically because uh, Country Z banned imports of those products. So these export dependent industries could only get their supplies locally and their costs went up. Um, and as a result, they their ability to compete was uh, sharply limited, which means uh, in basically that uh, you know competition is based on price right um, price or quality so um, you know there, there was something about um, well the right answer is going to relate to that in some way that uh, something about prices prices going up and that translating to an inability to compete let's look for that in the answer choices uh, choice A, profit margins in those industries were not high enough to absorb the rise in costs mentioned above. So this sounds tempting because what it says is, you know, I mean, if profit margins had been high enough in the export dependent industries that were affected here, um, the rise in costs by having to use domestic whatever the heck they are, whatever this product is, uh, the rise in cost wouldn't have necessarily impacted their ability to compete. They could still export goods at the same price. Um, the passage suggests that they weren't able to keep the same price point um, in the global market. So that's how the inability to import whatever the, this thing that they made is um, adversely affected them. Anyway, let's keep looking. Uh, choice B, those industries had to contend with the fact that other countries banned imports from country Z. Uh, there's no support for the conclusion that anybody banned imports. Again, support needs to actually be in the passage. The passage for choice A, it says, hey, costs went up and that hurt their ability to compete. 
their support for the idea that they didn't have much room for error in their in their costs. Choice B, there is no support for uh, retaliatory banning. Choice C, those industries succeeded in expanding the domestic market for their products. No support for the domestic market. Um, only We're only talking about the export market. Uh, choice D, steps to offset rising materials costs by decreasing labor costs were taken in those industries. So choice D would have been the reason why they weren't affected by the increase in costs for, again, whatever this... Uh, whatever these types of products are that we're talking about. Um, so if they had the ability to decrease labor costs, they wouldn't have been uh, as affected in the export market. So choice D is kind of the opposite of what we were looking for. And then choice E, those industries started to move into export markets that they had previously judged unprofitable. Um, so that, that could have been an explanation. Had this been an explain passage, explain why um, these you know, export-dependent co uh, companies um, suddenly found themselves uh, having trouble uh, competing in the export market. Um, this would have been potentially a reason. A better reason, of course, would be that the increase in costs was more than they could um, afford at their current prices. But choice E would have been a good explanation. It's not, however, an inference that is supported by the passage. We don't find anything about them changing their markets. So choice A is the correct answer. Page 505, question number 67. Several industries have recently switched, at least partly, from older technologies powered by fossil fuels to new technologies powered by electricity. It is thus evident that less fossil fuel is being used as a result of the operations of these industries than would have been used if these industries had retained their older technologies. Which of the following, if true, most strengthens the argument above? And I apologize for the sirens going past. It's nothing I did, I promise you. Okay, I think they're gone. Anyway, uh, so first off, of course, when whenever you you know have an argument that they don't summarize for you in the actual question, we need to summarize it for ourselves so that we can more accurately judge answer choices against that. The argument says that uh, less fossil fuel is being used as a result of this switch, even though even if it's a partial switch, less fossil fuel is being used by the switch from um, by the switch to electric uh, or technologies powered by electricity. So um, less fossil fuel used by switch to electric. So um, in order to strengthen that, we need to strengthen the idea that <clears throat> less fossil fuel is being used. Um, that's basically it. I mean, we just need to find another way that that is true. So choice A, many of the industries that have switched at least partly to the new technologies have increased their output. If anything, this is not what we want. If they've increased their output, um, and it says uh, at least partly, uh, they may actually be using more fossil fuel, the same amount or more, um, because their output has increased. So, you know, if their output is increased only because the switch to electricity is more efficient, then that makes sense. But if their output actually goes up, uh, their fuel costs of all types go up. So choice A does not help us at all. Uh, choice B, less fossil fuel was used to manufacture the machinery employed in the new technologies than was originally used to manufacture the machinery employed in the older technologies. So um, fossil fuel in the manufacture of the machinery is kind of irrelevant. We're talking about um, we're talking about the fossil fuel used in the operations of these industries, uh, and so that's more the fuel that's consumed in an ongoing way in the in, in the kind of running the machinery that they have in their industry. The fossil fuel that went into the construction of the machinery, while not irrelevant to the total equation, is not what the passage is actually about. Choice C. 
more electricity is used by those industries that have switched at least partly to the new technologies than by those industries that have not switched. We don't care how much electricity is being used in this question. We are specifically concerned with how much fossil fuel is being used and it needs to be less. Choice D, some of the industries that have switched at least partly to the new technologies still use primarily technologies that are powered by fossil fuels. Even if it's true, even if choice D is true, that they still use, um, if they still primarily use um, machinery powered by fossil fuels, if less fossil fuel is being used, um, it would strengthen the argument. Of course, choice D doesn't really say anything about that either way. We needed something that strengthened the notion that there were, that less fossil fuel was being used. All choice Ds, if, if anything, choice D sounds like it might weaken it, but it doesn't necessarily. It just, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, choice E, and of course, process of illumination got us to choice E, and it's likely to be correct, but let's see in what way it's correct so that we can perhaps identify future correct answers based on this, the analogy to this one. So the amount of fossil fuel used to generate the electricity needed to power the new technologies is less than the amount that would have been used to power the older technologies. So just to make it clear, so we have, we have the old tech, we have the new tech, this one was, the old tech was fossil fuel to into the old tech. The new one is fossil fuel because, of course, electricity is still typically generated, not always, but typically generated by fossil fuels. That goes into electricity, and that goes into the new technology. That's the background information needed. So choice E is saying that the fossil fuel, fossil fuel one, um, that fossil fuel one is uh, greater than fossil fuel two. That the amount that just would have, would have gone right into the machine is less than goes into generating the electricity, which then powers the new technology. So, um, did I say less? I meant that, yes, two is less than one, one is greater than two. Um, and so if this is true, and that's, the, that's how these questions work, right? It says, which of the following, if true, most strengthens the argument above? If um, the new way uses less fossil fuel. That strengthens the idea that this switchover to electricity uh, powered technology would inv involve less fossil fuel being used by these industries. So choice E is our correct answer. And with that, we finally say goodbye to page 505 and say hello to page 506. And question number 68. The local board of education found that because of because the current physics curriculum has little oh wow I'm having trouble reading today, the local board of education found that because the the current physics curriculum has little direct relevance to today's world, physics classes attracted few high school students. So to attract students to physics classes, the board proposed a curriculum that emphasizes the principles of physics involved in producing and analyzing visual images. Which of the following, if true, provides the strongest reason to expect that the proposed curriculum will be successful in attracting students? So we need to uh, strengthen it. Um, and of course, this is a proposal or a forecast. And remember that the default, um, the default assumption that you need to strengthen when, it, when it's a strengthening question is that the plan is actually going to work as intended based on its own terms. Um, and in strengthening um, forecasts and proposals, um, sometimes you're just stating what the assumption is. So in this case, we have this argument um, that, um, so let's see, how should I, how should I summarize this? Um, so we have this idea that visual images No, don't go away. There we go. Visual images will attract high school students. And um, 
the, because that's what the, the, the issue is here. Um, <clears throat> to attract high school students to physics, they're proposing a curriculum of visual images um, or the physics behind visual images. And the reason they chose visual images was that their previous stuff had, so the, the previous material that they had had little direct relevance to today's world. So um, we would probably want to strengthen the idea either that uh, visual images are attractive or the physics behind it is attractive to high school students or more likely that this physics behind vis visual images has direct relevance to, the, to today's world. Because the problem with the previous curricula uh, was that it didn't have direct relevance. They're switching to, to the processing of visual images, um, the assumption being that it has direct relevance. Strengthening that proposal will probably involve stating this assumption as additional evidence. So choice A. Um, some of the fundamental principles of physics are involved in producing and analyzing visual images. So this backs up the idea that, that the curriculum would be sound, but um, again, it doesn't actually strengthen the idea that this will attract students. Students are not typically attracted to classes, at least according to the passage, based on whether the fundamental principles of that thing are involved in the specific applications of those things. So we needed something that talked about the direct relevance um, or that high school students have really said that they're interested in visual images or something like that. Choice B, knowledge of physics is becoming increasingly important in understanding the technology used in today's world. So this one, I, I think, is tempting because it talks about today's world. So let's keep B. Um, choice C, equipment that a large producer of photographic equipment has donated to the high school could be used in the proposed curriculum. We're not worried about equipment. We're worried about whether the classes will attract students. Uh, choice D, the number of students interested in physics today is much lower than the number of students interested in physics 50 years ago. It's totally outside the scope of the passage. Uh, and then choice E, in today's world, the production and analysis of visual images is of major importance in communications, business, and recreation. So there's one that also mentions today's world. Let's compare B and E. So again, we need um, today's world. Both of those have that. So let's read B again. B says, knowledge, oh wait, yeah, B. Knowledge of physics is becoming increasingly important in understanding the technology used in today's world versus E. In today's world, the production and analysis of visual images is, is of major importance in communications, business, and recreation. So understanding technology, this one hinges on just understanding modern technology. And choice E hinges on um, kind of major fields of uh, activity, communication, business, and recreation. And so in terms of relevance to today's world, choice E, choice B just has that you can understand the technology. Um, Knowing that you can understand it does not necessarily make it attractive because, of course, you can use things without necessarily understanding them. I, um, I'm trying to think of an example of something that I use that I don't necessarily understand how it works. Well, let's just pretend that I, that I thought of one and I named it right there. Um, choice B, under, so knowledge of physics um, becoming important in understanding is not necessarily making it relevant to today's world. So just because you understand something doesn't mean it's relevant, whereas choice E, um, it's relevant to these very specific major things, especially like business, uh, which of course would attract a lot of high school students. Um, right. So basically, choice E is more about direct relevance. It's directly relevant because the, the activities of producing and analyzing visual images is of major importance in these worlds, whereas um, choice B is just about understanding those things without necessarily being uh, very important to uh, huge areas of the modern world. So choice B, less good. Choice E, much better because it's much more about the direct relevance.
as opposed to just understanding how things work. It's specifically applicable in those fields. Tricky one. Okay, on to number 69. Still page 506. Scientists have modified feed corn genetically, increasing its resistance to insect pests. Farmers who tried out the genetically modified corn last season applied less insecticide to their corn fields and still got yields comparable to those they would have gotten with ordinary corn. Ordinary corn seed, however, costs less, and what these farmers saved on insecticide rarely exceeded their extra costs for seed. Therefore, uh, for most feed corn farmers, switching to genetically modified seed would be unlikely to increase profits. Which of the following would it be most useful to know in order to evaluate the argument? And uh, again, what we've seen time and again with the which of, these which of the following would be useful to know is that really which of the following is something that could weaken the argument if it were true? Um, yeah, I think actually every one of these, which of the which of the following would be useful to know, was actually kind of a weakened question in disguise. So um, we need to weaken the idea. We need to weaken the conclusion. The conclusion is, for most feed corn farmers, switching to genetically modified seed would be unlikely to increase profits. So in terms of which would be useful to know, we need something that would say that, well, maybe it would save them some money in the long run after all. So this one is actually about money, and the correct answer should uh, reflect some element of the, of the plan or, or this conclusion as presented that would save them money. So choice A, would it be useful to know whether there are insect pests that sometimes reduce feed corn yields, but against which commonly used insecticides and the genetic modification are equally ineffective? I think the key there is equally ineffective. Um, if they're equally ineffective, this one does not save them money whether they use the traditional insecticide route or the genetically modified feed corn seed route. So choice A is kind of neutral. Um, choice B, whether the price that farmers receive for feed corn has remained steady over the past few years. Again, this one's actually pretty neutral because if yields are the same using genetically modified corn or using the traditional application of insecticide, if, if uh, yields are the same, what corn prices are doing does the same thing either way, no matter which of the two methods they use. We need something that makes, potentially, might make um, the genetic mod uh, profit greater than the pylon insecticide root. Anyway, choice C. Uh, whether the insecticides typically used on feed corn tend to be more expensive than insecticides typically used on other crops. So this one sounded um, good for a bit because it had costs related to insecticide and you know, again with the uh, genetic modification they use less insecticide so something about um, the insecticides costs sounded good, but then it goes in off the rails and says typically used on other crops. So, you know, choice C start, starts out sounding really good and then it goes crazy and gives us something outside the scope. We don't care about other crops. We care specifically about genetically modified corn versus traditional corn plus insecticide. It's not C. Uh, choice D, whether most of the farmers who tried the genetically modified corn last season applied more insecticide than was actually necessary. So let's think about this one. If they applied more insecticide that was actually necessary, they could apply less, which would in turn reduce um, the cost because remember they still applied some insecticide um, on this one. versus the all insecticide all the time version. Um, so if they actually applied less uh, insecticide, which costs money, <clears throat> then the cost for the genetically modified feed corn, the total costs for the cost for the seed plus the insecticide that they applied could potentially be less than just the all insecticide version. So choice D 
Sounds pretty good. Choice E, whether for, the, for most farmers who plant feed corn, it is their most profitable crop. Completely outside the scope, we care only about this one crop, not this crop compared to others. So choice D has a reason or a thing that would be useful to know um, in determining whether profits would be exactly the same or, or actually, what does it actually say? It says, um, switching to genetically modified seed uh, would be unlikely to increase profits. If they could apply a lot less insecticide, um, or even somewhat less, it doesn't actually have to be a lot less because the uh, prices were about the same. So any any change in the amount of insecticide applied would um, increase the profits of this side and decrease the profits of the other side. So choice D is our correct answer. It's a way that costs could go down. Page 506, <clears throat> question number 70. Although aspirin has been proven to eliminate moderate fever associated with some illnesses, many doctors no longer routinely recommend its use for this purpose. A moderate fever stimulates the activity of the body's disease-fighting white blood cells and also inhibits the growth of many strains of disease-causing bacteria. If the statements above are true, which of the following conclusions is most strongly supported by them? So this is an inference question, and so there isn't really a whole lot of um, summarizing that, I, or a whole lot of um, predicting that we can do, um, because we, we don't necessarily know what parts of the argument we would be drawing an inference from. We just have to go to the answer choices and make sure that whichever one we choose is supported by information in the passage. I guess that's the big key, is that inferences will often seem like very small logical leaps because it uses a lot of the stuff actually from the passage because that's the point of inferences. They're small logical steps that the author, um, or that, that you can make without uh, bringing in any additional information. So choice A, aspirin, an effective painkiller, alleviates the pain and discomfort of many illnesses. So that's True, right? If you've ever had aspirin, it definitely does that, but it's not supported by information in the passage. The passage is entirely about aspirin as a fever reducer, not as a painkiller. So choice A is one of those ones where um, if you bring in outside knowledge, choice A sounds amazing. That's totally true, but it's not what the passage is about. Choice B, aspirin can prolong a patient's illness by eliminating moderate fever helpful in fighting some diseases. So um, we do hear about fighting diseases and, and how moderate fever can be helpful. It says a moderate fever stimulates the activity of the body's disease-fighting white blood cells. If aspirin reduces the fever and the body has fewer disease-fighting white blood cells, we can infer that taking aspirin might actually prolong the disease uh, because if the fever had gone on unchecked, uh, perhaps the uh, disease would have been a little bit shorter because the white blood cells went and did, you know, their their thing. So choice B, tempting. Let's keep going. Choice C, aspirin inhibits the growth of white blood cells, which are necessary for fighting some illnesses. So choice C is um, kind of tempting, but it uses very strong language. All that the passage says is that um, moderate fever uh, stimulates the production of white blood cells. As, and so, and by taking aspirin, you do not get that stimulation. That's not the same thing as actually inhibiting the growth of white blood cells. So choice C kind of takes it in, um, it's kind of the extreme answer choice. It's too much to infer that it actually inhibits white blood cells. Choice D, the more white blood cells a patient's body produces, the less severe the patient's illness will be. Um, again, this one's kind of an extreme, um, an extreme answer because, of course, white blood cells can't fix everything. Um, and, of course, and, an, and an excess of white blood cells is actually bad for you. So um, choice D is not an inference that, uh, that we can actually make. Uh, choice E, the focus of modern medicine is on inhibiting the growth of disease-causing bacteria within the body. Um, and again, this is another extreme answer. Just because um, some doc or many doctors no longer routinely recommend the use of aspirin does not mean that the focus of modern medicine is on this technique. 
So choice E uh, changes many doctors, you know, not necessarily doing something anymore to making that the entire focus of modern medicine, which is absolutely extreme. Choice B, um, we can infer that by reducing disease-fighting agents in the body, the disease may be prolonged. On to, this is page 506 to 507, number 71. So Roland says, the alarming fact is that 90% of the people in this country now report that they know someone who is unemployed. Sharon responds, but a normal moderate level of unemployment is 5%, with one out of 20 workers unemployed. So at any given time, if a person knows approximately 50 workers, one or more will very likely be unemployed. Sharon's argument relies on the assumption that. So this is an interesting uh, one of these, you know, when we're given point and counterpoint, where uh, the question is actually really only asking about what Sharon is saying. Um, and, you know, to the extent that she's answering Roland, we do need to take Roland's argument into account but we need to figure out what her ultimate assumption is. So her assumption is that, her conclusion is that if you know approximately 50 workers um, based on the unemployment rate, you know, one out of 20. So she's saying if one out of 20, uh, I should probably just, one out of 20 is unemployed, and this is the normal unemployment rate, Um, that if you know 50 people, you um, know someone unemployed. So um, in terms of assumptions, um, well, let's, let's, let's see what this one looks like. Um, without making a prediction. There is a prediction that you can make, but I'm not sure that this one is necessarily as obvious as, um, as some of the other ones have been. So let's, let's do this one as if, um, as if we just, we don't really see what the assumption is, but we're going to need a connection between um, this rate and how any given person, if they know 50 people, will know somebody who's unemployed. So we know that there's going to be some kind of connection between these two, but we don't really know what it is yet. Let's try it that way. So choice A, normal levels of unemployment are rarely exceeded. Um, Sharon's argument doesn't really assume this um, because, I mean, A, pretty much everyone knows that unemployment is variable. Um, B, even if it's exceeded, all that would do is simply make it even more likely that if you no 50, 50 workers, that somebody is unemployed and that it doesn't make it necessarily a bigger deal. So she's not assuming uh, A. Uh, is she assuming that unemployment is not normally concentrated in geographically isolated segments of the population? So this one's interesting. Her argument is that any given person, if they know 50 workers, they probably know someone who's unemployed. If unemployment is geographically isolated, like for example, um, an entire town or an entire city experiences massive unemployment, as we've actually seen in our economy recently with places like Detroit, um, that uh, a person in that area may know a lot more people who are unemployed and someone who knows 50 people in a part of the country that's still doing better, um, they may not know anyone because it's geographically uh, limited. So her assumption is that unemployment is distributed evenly across the country so that any given, um, any given person who knows 50 people will know somebody unemployed. If it's not kind of, if this one out of 20 unemployed is not spread out evenly, that wouldn't necessarily work. So choice B is pretty good. Uh, choice C, the number of people who each know someone who is unemployed is always higher than 90% of the population. So while choice, so this choice C is actually also tempting. We should probably keep that one because she is saying that if one out of 20 is the normal unemployment rate, and if you know 50 people, you probably know someone who's unemployed, that that's really common. Um, 
it is sort of tempting to say that the number of people who know somebody unemployed is always higher than 90% if 5% is the normal unemployment. Anyway, let's keep going. Let's check D. Roland is not consciously distorting the, st the statistics he presents. So uh, this is an interesting one because, um, quite frankly, this could actually be an assumption in an argument. It's not a very interesting one, logically. Well, I'm just assuming you're not lying to me. Um, in this particular case, though, Sharon's argument does not rely on Roland's statistics. She provides statistics of her own, and that's where her assumption is. So while D could have been the assumption in some other argument where she says, well, based on your statistics, this is the result, uh, she's using her own. So choice D is not um, relevant. And then E, knowledge that a personal acquaintance is unemployed generates more fear of losing one's job than does knowledge of unemployment statistics. Probably also true, totally outside the scope. So let's get back between B and C. So, and what we're looking for is the assumption in her argument. Is the assumption that uh, unemployment is not uh, geographic or geographically limited. And that actually does sound like the assumption here that uh, if, if there's this average of one out of 20 unemployed, if it's distributed evenly across the country, then any given person would probably know someone who's unemployed. Or is it C? Is she assuming that the number of people who each know someone who is unemployed is always higher than 90% of the population? So what I think, I mean, I think that makes, that highlights the distinction a little bit more clearly. Choice C, if unemployment is geographically di uh, distributed evenly, then you could infer that the number of people who each know someone who is unemployed is always higher than 90%, but that's only if it's not geographically limited somehow. So um, choice B is an assumption both in Sharon's argument and in choice C. So um, does that make sense? That uh, it, the, if, if uh, unemployment is kind of spread out evenly, then both, if you know 50 people, you, you know someone who's unemployed, um, and 90% of the people in the country will know someone who's unemployed. If everyone unemployed is in Wisconsin, I'm picking on Wisconsin because that's where I live, um, all the people in states not in Wisconsin, would, and which would be more than 90% of the population of the US would not know someone who was unemployed. So um, choice B is an assumption li linked to both answer choice C and to Sharon's argument. So B is the correct answer, C is just another conclusion that you could draw. Page 507, on to number 72. Uh, community activist says, if Morganville wants to keep its central shopping district healthy, it should prevent the opening of a huge save-all discount department store on the outskirts of Morganville. Records from other small towns show that whenever save-all has opened a store outside the central shopping district of a small town, within five years, the town has experienced the bankruptcies of more than a quarter of the stores in the shopping district. The answer to which of the following would be most useful for evaluating the community activist's reasoning. So again, this, you know, which of the following would be most useful to know? We want something that would potentially weaken the conclusion. Um, so we want, the conclusion is that basically save all leads to 25%, is it 25%? More than 25%, 25% bankruptcy. So that's the community activist is saying that save all leads to uh, bankrupt twenty five percent bankruptcy in five years. So um, we need to find out whether so in terms of what we're looking for in the answer choices, we probably want something that relates to save all and bankruptcy. Or, yeah, basically. So choice A, have community activists in other towns successfully campaigned against the opening of a save-all store on the outskirts of their towns? So again, um, whether they've been successful or not, that might be, choice A would be the right answer to one of the questions to a, um, a question about whether, whether uh, campaigning against save-all will be successful. Here, 
we just need to evaluate the community activists reasoning which is that save all is bad um, whether community activists have been successful does not affect whether save all leads to bankruptcy in other stores so choice B do a large percentage of the residents of Morganville currently do almost all their shopping at stores in Morganville this actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if 100% of the shoppers uh, come from outside Morganville, um, because it doesn't it, it doesn't impact you know um, the arrival of Save All, or doesn't relate to the arrival of Save All to Morganville. Uh, choice C: In towns with healthy central shopping districts, what proportion of the stores in those districts suffer bankruptcy during a typical five-year period? So choice C is asking um, what is um, the normal bankruptcy percentage. And this could potentially weaken the argument that Save All causes this bankruptcy. Because, for example, um, if the normal bankruptcy um, in five years in any healthy central shopping district is, you know, 24% uh, or 26% or something like that, um, then the arrival of a save-all causing 25% bankruptcy in other communities is really weakened because that's something that might have happened anyway without the arrival of save-all. So um, knowing what the normal bankruptcy rate is is absolutely critical in determining whether save-all's arrival has the effect that the community activist says it has. So choice C sounds really good. Um, choice D, what proportion of the employees at the Save All store on the outskirts of Morganville will be drawn from Morganville? So, I mean, of course, competition for jobs is a factor that could lead to bankruptcy of small stores, but that's not actually what we're worried about. We're certainly not worried about uh, the employment pool, so uh, choice D is not it. And then E, do newly opened Save All stores ever lose money during their first five years of operation? We also don't care about whether they lose money. So choice C is the one that addresses the connection between the bankruptcy rate and the arrival of Save All by questioning that connection. Choice C implies, or you know, depending on what the answer is, it may suggest that there's no connection between Save All and that 25% bankruptcy in five years. Last one on page 507. In comparison to the standard typewriter keyboard, the EFCO keyboard, which places the most used keys nearest the typist's strongest fingers, allows faster typing and results in less fatigue. Therefore, replacement of standard keyboards with the EFCO keyboard will result in an immediate reduction of typing costs. Which of the following, if true, would most weaken the conclusion drawn above? The conclusion being, um, going to these FCO keyboards will result in immediate reduction of typing costs. So to weaken that conclusion, we need a reason why costs aren't going to go down um, immediately. That seems pretty straightforward. Let's look in the answer choices for something that results in costs not going down. Um, and immediately. Uh, so, choice A, people who use both standard and FCO keyboards report greater difficulty in the transition from the FCO keyboard to the standard keyboard than in the transition from the standard keyboard to the FCO keyboard. Um, the passage is about a one-time transition from the standard keyboard to the FCO keyboard. Knowing that it's harder to go back um, from FCO back to standard is outside the scope of the passage. So it's not A. Uh, choice B, FCO keyboards are no more expensive to manufacture than our standard keyboards and require less frequent repair than do standard keyboards. So this actually would strengthen the argument, which we don't want to do. <laughs> We're actually trying to weaken it. So choice B, right answer to a different question. Choice C, the number of business, and this is actually, I mean, they don't do this to you very often on the GMAT, you know, basically just using the OG as, as our example, which is, not entirely logical, keeping in mind that the OG is always, you know, kind of years behind what the current GMAT is offering. Um, but this does happen enough that you do need to be on the lookout for it, that they will give you on strengthen or weaken questions, 
they will give you wrong answer choices that do the opposite of what you're after. This is particularly problematic when they only do it once. If only one of the answer choices strengthens and only one of them weakens, then it could be even more tempting if you've lost track of what the question is actually about. Anyway, choice C. Uh, the number of businesses and government agencies that use EFCO keyboards is increasing each year. Nice for EFCO keyboard makers. Bad for our answer. Choice D, the more training and experience an employee has had with the standard keyboard, the more costly it is to train that employee to use the EFCO keyboard. So this one at least addresses, co addresses costs. Um, and remember, the argument was there's an immediate reduction of typing costs. Um, and choice D says the more someone is used to the old keyboard, the more, the more costly it is to um, switch which implies that there is not necessarily an immediate reduction of costs. So we'll keep D and check E. Novice typists can learn to use the EFCO keyboard in about the same amount of time that it takes them to learn the standard keyboard. If anything, this strengthens the argument um, a little bit by saying that um, the barrier to entry is the same, or you know, whatever your opportunity costs or however you want to think about it. Um, and and then, of course, the costs in the long run are still lower because of uh, less fatigue and whatever. So choice E also strengthens. We don't want that. We need to weaken it. Choice D gives us a reason why it's not necessarily going to be a big cost savings. So that's good. That's what we wanted. We can turn the page now to page 508 and question number 74. In the past, the country of Malvernia has relied heavily on imported oil. Malvernia recently implemented a program to convert heating systems from oil to natural gas. Malvernia currently produces more natural gas each year than it uses, and oil production in Malvernia, Malvernian oil fields is increasing at a steady pace. If these trends in fuel production and usage continue, therefore, Malvernian reliance on foreign sources for fuel is likely to decline soon. Which of the following would it be most useful to establish in evaluating the argument? And again, we're looking for something that might weaken the argument. Because basically, in establishing that this weakening factor either exists or it doesn't exist, then we can evaluate the value of the argument. But it's going to have something that could potentially weaken the argument. The argument is uh, that... Malvernian reliance on foreign sources for fuel is likely to decline. Um, and their evidence is that oil is up and they have surplus natural gas. And um, and the additional evidence is that they have uh, recently converted the heating system from, uh, I probably should have done this. The heat went from oil to gas. So that gives them even more um, extra oil and allows them to use some of the surplus natural gas. So their reduced dependence on foreign oil um, relates to these two trends and uh, this uh, fact. So in, or, in order to, what would be things that could weaken this? Um, perhaps some other uses for oil and natural gas? Um, or something that says that maybe the trend for oil is limited, you know, maybe they several refineries are scheduled to go offline or who knows what, um, or that natural gas, they have a new, another new use for natural gas. Um, anyway, so it's, the correct answer is going to hinge on uh, something that might weaken number one, two, or three. Let's take a look. Choice A, when, if ever, will production of oil in Malvernia outstrip production of natural gas? So we don't actually care about these two relative to each other, I don't think. Um, we don't have enough information to know, you know, how much of each they need. So if oil, you know, ends up being more than natural gas, more than natural gas at some at some point, 
you know, their, their rates are outside the scope of the passage. Now, choice B, is Malvernia among the countries that rely most on imported oil? We don't care what other countries are doing. We just need to know whether this is actually going to reduce their dependence on foreign fuel. Uh, choice C, what proportion of Malvernia's total energy needs is met by hydroelectric, hydroelectric solar, and nuclear power? Um, and again, the proportion here is still outside the scope. Um, all we need, basically, is for the domestic supply of oil and natural gas to increasingly meet Malvernia's needs. And so knowing the proportion of um, basically these other fuels that are kind of more native to Malvernia um, is irrelevant. Choice D, is the amount of oil used each year in Malvernia for generating electricity and fuel for transportation increasing? So um, this one, choice D, Choice D would have a downward effect on the supply of oil, um, and because if the if they if the amount is going up um, that they use for you know for fuel and for uh, uh, electricity generation, even though they've switched their heating system from oil to gas, um, if the fuel costs uh, are or the, the uses for fuel are going up the oil may not be enough to meet their needs and they might still have to um, rely on foreign fuel. So choice D, pretty good. And then let's check E. Have any existing oil burning heating systems in Malvernia already be been converted to natural gas burning heating systems? And I'm not sure this actually matters whether any have been um, done. If the majority had already been done, you, we, we could expect that this Choice three might not actually have that much of an impact if 99% of the systems had already been converted and now they've just announced finishing it, that wouldn't necessarily signal a sudden decrease in the direction of dependence on uh, foreign oil, uh, foreign fuels. Um, but so just whether any has have been done, you know, if, if a few places did it, what difference does that make? It's still, their argument still holds true. So choice E, not helpful to us. Leaving us with choice D, um, this idea that there may be other factors that impact these two fuels other than just heat. Okay, two more. Page 508, number 75. An overly centralized economy, not the changes in the climate, is responsible for the poor agricultural production in country X since its new government came to power. Neighboring country Y has experienced the same climatic conditions, but while agricultural production has been falling in country X, it has been rising in country Y. Which of the following, if true, would most weaken the argument above? So, um, country X, country Y, the ag production has been going down in country X and up in country Y. The argument is that it's the economy. No, come on. There we go. Not the climate. So to weaken this argument, we basically need to say either no, it's not the economy, or yes, it's the climate, or the uh, reasoning that they use, since they have the same climate, That's the evidence used to support the notion that it's something other than the climate, that they both have the same climate and country Y has been going up and country X has been going down. We would need a reason to say that, that it's still somehow the climate or something. So we either need to say yes climate or no economy to weaken the argument. Let's look for that. Choice A, industrial production is also declining in country X. If anything, that would strengthen the idea that it's the economy, and we need to weaken it, so that's not it. 
Choice B, whereas country Y is landlocked, country X has a major seaport. I don't know what that has to do with anything. It doesn't really affect agriculture or the economy, necessarily. Uh, choice C, both country X and country Y have been experiencing drought conditions. This we actually already found out. We found out that this is that they have the same climate, um, so they both have droughts. Uh, country wise, agricultural production has gone up though. So um, the C doesn't do anything for us. It certainly doesn't weaken the idea that it's the climate or the economy, excuse me. Uh, choice D, the crops that have always been grown in country X are different from those that have always been grown in country Y. So if the crops are different, um, perhaps responding differently to different climatic conditions, that could explain, you know, if country wise, um, if the changes in climate have um, been favorable to the crops grown in country Y, but unfavorable to the crops grown in country X, that could explain why the same climate in the two countries could result in different directions in their agricultural production. So choice D gives us a reason why it could be the climate rather than the economy. So it's, you know, number one here. Let's check E. Country X's new government instituted a centralized economy with the intention of ensuring an equitable distribution of goods. Nice of them, but outside the scope. Uh, because we needed something that said either yes to the climate or no to the economy. Choice E does nothing to explain the difference in agricultural production. Choice D is our correct one. Okay, last one, page 508, question number 76. Because no employee wants to be associated with bad news in the eyes of a superior, information about serious problems at lower levels is progressively softened and distorted as it goes up each step in the management hierarchy. The chief executive is, therefore, less well informed about problems at lower levels than are his or her subordinates at those levels. The conclusion drawn above is based on the assumption that. So, um, so we have evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. So CEO not well informed. The evidence is um, that subordinates distort information. And so the assumption is somehow going to relate to, um, well, the assumption is basically that this info, that this distorted info is what goes right to the CEO. I mean, or that, that uh, basically, in order for it to be true that the CEO is not well informed, um, the information that the CEO, he or she gets from subordinates needs to be basically the only source of information that he gets or she gets. So if the CEO got different information from other sources, reading the newspaper, reading other types of financial reports, um, the CEO would not necessarily be poorly informed. Since the argument has the CEO being poorly informed, the distorting, the distorted info from subordinates must be the only source of information. Otherwise, the CEO would be better informed. So let's look for something like that in the answer choices. Uh, choice A, um, is, is the, the question assuming that problems should be solved at the level in, in the management hierarchy at which they occur? That might be true, but that's certainly not an assumption made. We we need the assumption to relate to how the C, excuse me how the CEO gets information. Uh, choice B: Employees should be rewarded for accurately reporting problems to their superiors. Again, that would be nice, but that doesn't necessarily that's not an assumption. We need um, something that talks about the information going to the CEO. Choice C, problem solving ability is more important at higher levels than it is at lower levels of the management hierarchy. Doesn't even deal with information transmission. Choice D, chief executives obtain information about problems at lower levels from no source other than their subordinates. That sounds like what we wanted, tying the flow of information specifically from subordinates to the CEO. And then choice E, some employees are more concerned about truth than about the way they are perceived by their superiors. 
that's true too, but again, really outside the scope um, because this was more about general statements. So choice D is the only one that ties the information in our evidence, distorted info, to the CEO not getting good info. So choice D basically confirms that the uh, distortion of information by subordinates leads to um, poorly informed chief executives. Choice D is correct. Okay, so we will stop there on this occasion. Next time we will pick up with the bold-faced question number 77 on page 508. That next time is tomorrow. So if you are watching this broadcast, you can watch it the same time tomorrow if you're watching it in a recorded format. It may not be tomorrow. It may be 30 seconds from now, the time it takes you to click on links to get to the next one. In any case, thanks for joining me. My name's Jim Jacobson, and you've been watching Grocket.com.